Hello, and welcome to U.S. History class. We are on Chapter 11. We are um, discussing World War II, and the name of your chapter is Fighting the Good Fight. I'm going to reach down here and grab my book. Sorry, it's on the ground. Okay, so it's 1941 to 1945. We have a lot of different things to talk about. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is who are the terrorists? Uh, throughout American history, or U.S. history, um, it changes constantly who the terrorists are considered to be. So it's really important that we uphold the laws of the Constitution and we have due process and that sort of thing because you don't know when your group might be considered uh, the group that is the terrorist at the time. So, you know, throughout history we have, you know, at first the Native American was the terrorist or the threat and actually the, the U.S. Um, the lands um, of this new world that actually wasn't new um, belonged to another people, the Native Americans. They were the first ones here. Over 400 uh, treaties were broken um, by the U.S. government um, in taking their lands. Um, then you have the English, you know, when the Revolutionary, well, first we have the Revolutionary War um, was fought. Um, and the English were considered um, the terrorists, uh, the Tories, the English, and that sort of thing. Um, then you have the free, the free slaves, you know, that, that they're a threat, okay? Um, so you have African Americans are seen as a threat in the South to the point that they, you know, make black codes and um, take away their um, rights as a citizen of the United States of America. Uh, then we have the Germans. We come to World War I. We have the Germans are considered a terrorist threat. And I don't know about you, but I do have some German, um, you know, um, heritage for sure. And you may as well. Uh, there was a time in U.S. history where the Irish were seen not so much as a threat, but they were treated horribly due to phrenology, which phrenology is just looking at your school skull and seeing how smart you are. And the Irish at one time were considered to be, um, of course, it was wrong um, scientific information, but they were considered to be um, very um, primitive not smart, very unintelligent, uh, just like African Americans were wrongly accused as well. And that was a lot of social Darwinism and false science. Then you have the Japanese um, in World War II where they were actually put into internment camps. And we will hear, I don't know if you know who George Taki is, but he was on uh, Star Trek and he was actually put in a Japanese internment camp when he was five years old. So you will actually watch a video about that this week. Um, and he talks about how, you know, they separated men and women and children. And he talks about how if someone had taken him away from his mother, it would have destroyed him. Um, that he barely made it uh, with his mother by his side and his father separated from him. So just really interesting um, that they were put into internment camps. We'll talk more about that later. And, you know, now, more present day, a lot of Arab Americans, a lot of Arabs are uh, looked upon um, as terrorists. But we have to be really, really careful because you never know when it's going to be your group. Um, so I just wanted to uh, talk about that. Military bases are also really uh, talked about because of World War II. Um, and I did look up military bases. Um, and it's amazing. I encourage you to as well. But the U.S. has over almost 600 military bases in 42 countries. And most first world countries do not have that many. Uh, the U.K. has 11. France has 11. Russia has nine. China has only one um, military base outside of their own. Um, just really interesting. Something to look at. We really talked about that in grad school a lot. You know, why are there so many? Um, and how much money is funneled to those? Okay, um, so Pearl Harbor, uh, we'll talk about, um, and there was, um, there was, uh, several heroes in Pearl Harbor. When we get closer to that, there was actually a hero that we're going to talk about later that, um, he was not allowed to actually man a gun because he was an African American. And actually when everyone was kind of blown up on his ship, he, he crawls up through the ship and was brave and got a gun um, on the on the deck and uh, fought back and um, really made a name for African Americans in the future. 
Um, and we'll talk about him more when we get to Pearl Harbor and his name. I'm also going to talk about Holocaust and bullets. I actually um, went to a conference um, where a lot of the Jews that were murdered in uh, World War II weren't in the concentration camps because Hitler was running out of time. So he just told his different soldiers wherever they were, you know, Poland, Romania, wh wherever, um, to just dig a pit or a ditch and um, tell the Jews they were going to be hiking to uh, Jerusalem and then take them to a certain place and shoot them and murder them um, because he wanted to carry out his plans in a more timely manner because he knew his end was near. We're going to talk about communism. Um, also, there was such a racial divide in um, the United States during World War II that um, the armed forces were segregated. Um, let's see. We're going to also talk about the Great Depression. Um, you know, Roosevelt, uh, FDR, really got um, the American people out of the Depression by um, employing experts, and we've talked about experts, academic experts of all kinds and having them come together and come up with ideas. And you know, that's where he had his um, fireside chats where he would talk to men that were in work camps, giving them work and food and things to do. And he took some big risks that Hoover was not willing to take and he did save the nation. Um, you know, with his WPA projects um, and programs. Um, and then World War II came along. And what you need to understand about history and war is that many times war can put a country um, in debt, but sometimes war can actually help it um, financially. And in your book, it did talk about 70% um, of the um, companies made a profit off of World War II. Okay, Great Depression, we talked about that. We also, um, you know, talking about the Great Depression, a lot of the cause of that was high tariffs. Um, you know, when, when you charge different countries a ton of money uh, to take your products, it's gonna slow down and that's like a historical theme throughout history, American history. Also, there was a large wage gap between the very, very wealthy and the poor and more money was being hoarded by the wealthy and they weren't spending it. And because there was a, a stoppage on spending, which if that money is in the middle class and lower class, they spend it because they have, you know, they need food and, and clothing and, and gasoline. Um, because it was being hoarded by the upper class, um, it really caused um, a breakdown as well. All right, so we wanted to talk, I wanted to talk about scapegoats for a minute too, um, because that is kind of a theme in your chapter. And of course, the scapegoat here, I think there were several um, scapegoats. Um, okay, so scapegoats. So you have the Jews are definitely scapegoats in Germany. Also the Japanese maybe here in, um, in the US. Um, and what is a scapegoat? So oftentimes, People say things like, you know, if we got rid of all the, you know, this group, uh, whether it's the Jews, Japanese, um, you know, putting them in internment camps, um, or, you know, maybe it's immigrants or all of this group or that group, we wouldn't have any problems. And that's actually not true at all, especially in history. And what happens when we do that in history is that a group is really um, abused. All right. Um, so you see the Jews, you know, Hitler was saying, if we get rid of them, there'll be more resources for the rest of us. Everything will be great. And that's just not true because you still have the same issues. You still have, you know, poverty or you still have, you know, crime or you still have different issues. So one way that, uh, that Hitler really won over the, um, the churches in Germany was he's like, let's get rid of um, the prostitutes. Let's get rid of, you know, this crime element. And what he did is, yes, he killed many prostitutes, but he kept many for his um, for his officers. So he kind of, he hid and it wasn't he didn't really abide by what he was saying. Um, and you know what? Killing prostitutes isn't going to solve the problem. 
um, or he was very much against um, uh, gays. And so he, he really, he would put people in boxes and have a panel watching them and in a clear box, like on a stage or whatever. And if they could not have sex in front of him, um, and they were, you know, accused of being gay, he would, um, put them in, um, a camp. Um, that is not the problem either. Um, there's still issues with poverty. There's still issues with crime. Um, so getting rid of any group, um, you know, kind of an us versus them paradigm, uh, instead of, you know, looking at it as a human problem that we all need to work together on, um, the scapegoat, um, idea is really dangerous and fascists very much like to use it. Okay. So you have fascism with Mussolini. He was one of the first fascists, you know, upcoming. Um, but he really had trouble having as much power as like Hitler and Stalin because, um, of the king of, uh, Italy and the church had so much power. So he had trouble being as powerful as he wanted to be. Um, we need to talk about, um, nationalism and you know nativism and they seem like great things but actually patriotism is a much better you know road to follow because nationalism actually um isolates and says there's only one kind of german okay so then they you know get rid of you know different germans that are of color people of color um jews um they got rid of people that had disabilities um and so they uphold this one kind of German, and in Hitler's case, it was, you know, blonde, blue-eyed, except that Hitler wasn't blonde or blue-eyed. And so what you normally find in this national movement is it's super hypocritical. So he's like breeding people to be blonde and blue-eyed. He's not blonde and blue-eyed. Um, in fact, many people think maybe he was of Jewish descent because his mother had him illegitimately and she worked for a very rich J Jewish man as a house cleaner. So then you ostracize, abuse, oppress, um, and you make an us, them paradigm again with nationalism. Um, it can happen in any country, um, the U S you know, you might think that this is, you know, the perfect American, and then you're leaving out so many Americans because native Americans are Americans, African Americans are Americans, Japanese Americans. Um, we talked about Mexican Americans as well, really felt betrayed in this time frame, Um, and it still happens today. All right. So nationalism is very dangerous because it really pushes out and says that there's one kind when in actuality, that's not true at all. Um, you know, Americans are every color, every religion, um, based on freedom of religion. And, you know, the first Americans were the national, were the uh, native Americans. So you have to really be careful because nationalism, um, extreme nationalism and nativism is really a sign of fascism. Um, and it actually was mentioned in your book. Extreme unity of country militarism. They use social Darwinism saying this group isn't as smart. This group isn't as good. We know social Darwinism isn't true. Um, Darwin never took his biological scientific um, studies and applied them to society. And then it turns into fascism turns into such unity is required that it's a single party. Okay. So Mussolini had a one party system. Okay. That's a little scary. Um, we also need to understand that, um, the Nazi party was called the national, national socialist party, and they were not socialists. It was really a totalitarian government. It was really just a dictatorship. Again, communism, when we talk about it in Russia, um, communism has actually never existed as according to Karl Marx in his writings. Um, it's just been an excuse for a dictatorship. No one's ever done it like Marx wrote about, um, if you read the Communist Manifesto. Um, so Hitler becomes, you know, a fascist. Um, he says he's going to restore Germany, Germany's greatness. But who is going to pay the cost to restore Germany's greatness in this nationalist movement? Will the Jews really pay? Poland really pays. People of color, 
um, really pay. All right, so it's it's restoring it to uh, the cost of who. All right, then you have the um, you have the uh, Japanese Empire. Also, they're being a very aggressive. They're having kind of a nationalist movement too. Really, a lot of nationalism caused World War Two, and World War One. Um, Japanese Empire. They were raping Chinese women and killing them. Much a lot of nat nativism, a lot of nationalism. Um, I know, like. You hear the word nationalism, you think it's great, but it's patriotism. Patriotism is for every person in America that loves their country, regardless of color, race, creed. Okay. Um, you know, a patriotic um, person in Japan would be every race, creed. Okay. But this is a national movement and they are um, raping and killing Chinese women and they're leaning towards fascism as well. All right. Um, you read about a Jewish ship called the USS St. Louis that had many Jews that were escaping um, Germany. Um, and it is so sad to read about this ship because uh, Roosevelt turned it away. They, and they couldn't go to Cuba. They couldn't go to um, the U.S. I know they did finally land, but I want to say they went back to Europe and someone else let them land and have to safety to look that up. All right. So the U.S. looks at China and they can't really do anything because they're in this isolationist, you know, viewpoint. And they do send um, Ch uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, general, to help with democracy. We'll probably um, touch more on that later. He turns out to be someone who does not follow orders well. And really the democratic movement in China falls to pieces. Um, and these people are starving. I read a book about it, um, oh, Fan Shen. It was whew, amazing book. And it really just talked about how women, um, single women, many single women were having to, you know, maybe their husband died or whatever, were having to sell their children as servants, you know, to other, not slaves necessarily, but servants um, to live in different um, homes so that they could be fed and, um, because if they kept them, they would starve to death. So basically, you know, when the communists got to them and had food, they signed up to be communists because it was like the first person that fed them. So Chiang Kai-shek, the more we, we talk about him, he really fumbled um, orders and didn't listen and really messed up democracy in China. We'll also talk about the home front. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause the video and, and put a, more, a few more... Um, um, terms up there that we're going to go over and I'll be right back. Okay, we are back and we have a few more things to, to look over for chapter 11, uh, fighting the good fight in World War II. Uh, women and African Americans working in factories. Before this time, uh, women, um, <clears throat> were not really allowed to work in a factory. Uh, factory work was considered a very good wage. Um, you could make, uh, very decent money. Also, African Americans were not um, given that opportunity either. Um, they would have to do outlying and different jobs, um, even though um, we see here in the Great Migration, six million uh, African Americans moved from the South to the North over a period of many years, about um, you know the 1920s to the 1970s, um, because of the severe um, racism in the South. Um, the North wasn't perfect either. They didn't allow them to um, have certain jobs. They allowed them to vote and that, that sort of thing. And they didn't have the black codes, but there still was a lot of issues. They wouldn't let them move into their neighborhoods. They were often run out um, and they wouldn't let them have, you know, good jobs, equal, you know, equality and good jobs. So when um, the men went over um, in World War II, this also happened in World War I, but more so in World War II. You have Rosie the Riveter and that sort of thing. Um, they were uh, able to get those factory jobs, but then when the men came back, they were fired automatically, um, especially the women, but also African Americans. So that was an opening of a door um, but still it remained a teeny bit open, even though, um, you will notice, you know, you can read books like the feminine mystique and it talks about that if you had a baby, you'd get fired, um, because society felt that women had to stay home. It was, they had no choice. 
um, they were not given a choice. Okay. Um, we talked about um, wartime production. 70% of the companies in the U.S. profited. Um, we have December 7th, 1941 is Pearl Harbor. After that, you have, um, I wanted to get my numbers correct here. Um, you have Japanese rounded up, even citizens, okay? And 90% of Japanese citizens and immigrants were rounded up and put in internment camps. Uh, their money, their belongings left, many people looted them. Uh, their money was frozen. If they had anything in the bank, there was no due process of law. And that's why I opened this up with, you know, what if your group, your ethnic group or your religious group is the so-called terrorist? You know, we want that due process for everyone else because one day it might be us as we look through the, the list of people that were considered terrorists at one time or another. And I'm sure there's many more that I didn't mention in the U.S. that were considered. So after everything was done, 66% were born in the U.S. So those were citizens, guys. Even more than that, you know, maybe applied for citizenship. 130,000 Japanese were put in internment camps. Only 16,000 Germans and 2,300 Italians. Really doesn't seem... Germans were the ones who started the war. What I wanted to point out was, after all of this, how many Japanese do you think were convicted of spying or you know a good reason to put them in these camps how many do you think it was it's zero absolutely none um very deeply traumatic families were separated um and it was deeply traumatic and a lot of them lost their homes were taken over and they did not get them back um, their belongings everything they had and all they could do is bring clothes in a suitcase, that's it. So really traumatic, um, not a great point in history. Okay, I wanted to talk about, you know, most of the Jews in Hitler's time in, in Germany were able to escape. Many Germans helped them escape. Um, the Jews that, I'm not saying all of them, but the Jews that had the brunt of these internment camps were the Hasidic Jews, the ones that have the, you know, the curly hair and they are very um, conservative and, and have the hats and, and that sort of thing. And a lot of them lived in the outlying um, European countries. And many of them were in Poland. For some reason, Hitler really hated Poland. So he went into Poland, into the universities, and he killed their professors and their experts and burned their materials that they, their research. He was really just trying to like wipe out their culture. He just really hated them. So when you hear about a surviving Jew from Poland, they went through a lot to survive. Like it, they're just so many of them were just killed and murdered. Um, let's see, we talked about the great migration. <clears throat> And we talked about that. Oh, so um, talking about wartime, um, you know, there is a, um, I believe there's a movie, I think it's called Code Talkers, I'm not exactly sure, but, you know, a lot of the Navajo Indians were, um, their language was used um, to talk code in World War II. All right, um, really interesting. Might make that a bonus. All right, let's see what else we have. There were a lot of child care facilities, getting back to this factory, child care facilities that were set up by the government, sometimes close to different factories, sometimes inside factories. Um, like I said, you have Rosie the Riveter. We need to talk, come down here. Um, the Double V campaign was when, you know, um, African-American soldiers got home and they really wanted equality um, for their race. And, you know, it would be kind of a double victory um, because they helped free people of oppression. The Jews, you know, they helped free people of oppression, the Jews and the scapegoats um, all over the world. But then they come home and um, they're still oppressed. And they're not looked at seriously or given equality. And they were told to fight to free oppression. So it, it did make sense. And it was... Um, Definitely um, a point of contention. Let's see. 
um, the atomic bomb. Okay, we need to talk about the atomic bomb. So the atomic bomb obviously was dropped on Japan. Um, we know that the island fighting, going from island to island, had tons of casualties. But many people in history analyze why wasn't the atomic bomb dropped on Germany? Because they um, started the war. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. A lot of people think, well, because Germans looked a lot like us. Well, our our um, country has tons of Germans. Um, you know, is that why they didn't? Because there's, there's a lot of analysis in history that talks about this. Why would they drop them on the Japanese, but not Germany? When Germany started it, it did a lot more destruction. It could have been, the war could have been over way before had that happened. But a lot of people really um, have studied, a lot of experts, a lot of historians have really studied and looked into the fact that, you know, it's much easier to drop a bomb on a group of people that don't look like us. Um, and harder when it's a group that does. And that is actually something to look, look into, to think about, because this is really something that has been brought up by history and analysis and um, experts that have studied. Why? Very interesting. Um, let's see. Did Japanese internment camps. All right. All right. And then at the end of your um, chapter, it talks about how, you know, England and the U.S. made kind of a deal with the devil. Stalin was also uh, a fascist, but he was hiding. He was pretending. Um, and then we see his true colors later. Uh, when you look into Stalin and Hitler, they both were very evil men that killed many people. But if you look into uh, more deeply, um, Stalin actually killed more people, um, more of his own people. He, um, I believe he, he starved to death 8 million Ukrainians by shutting the border and they starved in different famines. He just hated farmers. Um, he was really like to study his life is really disturbing. Um, and I mean, in grad school, we learned that if you were at a Stalin rally, he would have soldiers look for people who were not clapping loud enough or enthusiastically enough. And if you were one of those people, they would pull you out and um, he would shoot you. So just really unpredictable. In fact, it is said at his funeral, that um, many of his friends um, were looking around, acting very, very sad and crying harder than normal because they weren't sure if he was truly dead or if he was just testing them um, because he killed so, so many of his own friends and had them, you know, appear at the show trials and that sort of thing. Okay, so um, Defying Hitler was a book that I brought in on Academic Day. Um, when we did the coffee house. And I told you about this man named Sebastian Hafner who lived at the ground level. That's bottom up history. And he lived at the ground level. This is such a fascinating book. Um, and uh, sometimes I have you read some of his excerpts from the book because it's from the ground level. But he talks about how, you know, how could Hitler take over? You know, Germany was a more democratic nation than the United States, um, is what experts say at the time of his takeover. Um, how did it happen? And he begins to talk about, you know, his SS, um, men would come in and do different things. And when he took over power from the government, and if you heard about your neighbors being killed and you said one word about it, you would be next. So just fear and, um, just fear, terror, and dread that your family and your children would be killed next. Um, I know Sebastian Havner was a lawyer and he has several chapters in it about how he would go in one day um, to the courts and the judge would be an appointed, you know, Hitler person who knew nothing about the law at all. And the lawyers would just pretend as they argued and then that judge would just state whatever he wanted. He didn't follow the law of the Constitution and they would just go along with it. Obviously, later, Sebastian Hefner got his girlfriend, smuggled her to um, France. That was later his wife. She was uh, part Jewish and in danger. And then he went to England and became a historian and a writer um, because he saw it firsthand. 
Okay, Japanese internment camps. Um, we will probably be reading um, some excerpts of the diary of Toyo Jiro Suzuki, um, which I've read in class before. Um, and it is, you know, they transport them. This man um, actually has a special needs child. And um, at first he's taken and not his wife. And they froze his money and he can't, his family can't eat because they have no money uh, in the banks. They've frozen him. He is transported like cattle um, in trains to these different Japanese internment camps. Um, and that is a really interesting um, diary uh, of his and how it turned out. Uh, my day, uh, we're going to take a look at that right now. I'm going to stop this. I want to show you about my day, Eleanor Roosevelt. Very interesting. One second. Okay, I'm back and I want to talk about my day. What is my day? So my day is a um, newspaper article that Eleanor Rosener, Roosevelt wrote and she wrote it every single day and she just kind of talked about what she saw in the White House. It was not, um, you know, political or partisan. It was just, um, you know, inspiring good people, good Americans, being kind to your neighbor and things like that. It was super interesting. And I will probably have you do an assignment where you look up a day, any day you want. I suggest you look up days um, that are historical in nature because, you, you know, you never know. It's what she's saying in the White House. So what we're going to do right now for my day is we are going to look up uh, December 7th, 1941 to see what she says. December 7th. Well, here's 1941. And we'll look at December 7th. Okay. Oh, how could that be? Oh, we might need to do the day after. We'll do the day after. Whoopsie, Daisy. Okay. All right. Um, so this is my day, um, Eleanor Roosevelt. She's in the White House, married to FDR. Washington, Sunday. I was going out in the hall to say goodbye to our cousins, Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Adams and their children after luncheon, and as I stepped out of my room, I knew something had happened. All the secretaries were there. Two telephones were in use. The senior military aides were on their way with messages. I said nothing because the words I heard over the phone were quite sufficient to tell me that finally the blow had fallen. We had been attacked. Attacked in the Philippines and Hawaii, and on the ocean between San Francisco and Hawaii, our people had been killed, not suspecting um, there was an enemy who attacked in the usual ruthless way, which Hitler was prepared, has prepared us to suspect. Because our nation has lived up to the rules of civilization, it will probably take us a few days to catch up with our enemy, but no one in this country will, will doubt the ultimate outcome. None of us can help but regret the choice which Japan has made. But having made it, she has taken a coalition of enemies she must, underest she must underestimate, unless she believes we have sadly deteriorated since our first ship sailed into her harbor. Okay, so it really talks about like the, um, you know, the somber mood in the White House and she knew that there was something wrong. Okay, and I was gonna give you a look at um, this man's diary. Um, you can find it online. I'll have a link if, if this is what we choose to use. I'm going to choose one of these primary sources. Um, so Toyo Jiro Suzuki um, was taken into a Japanese internment camp and these were translated but he has a diary of every day. Now most people were told not to have a diary. They didn't want you know, it to be let out what was going on and how they were being treated, but somehow he kept one, which is very helpful today in history. And then I wanted to show you a picture of, of Sebastian Hefner, um, Defying Hitler, the memoir, which really explains, we had to read it in grad school, what happened from the ground up, you know, that, you know, we have top down history, which is like, you know, great men, presidents, queens, but the bottom up history is, is the most fascinating because it, it's showing you from a normal citizen of Germany, how in the world did Hitler take over a country that was more democratic in nature than the United States of America? Okay. I told you um, that I was going to share with you a hero of Pearl Harbor, and I need to find that quickly because I really need to do that. 
So I will be right back. Okay, I found him. His name is uh, Dory. He went by Dory Miller. He was an American sailor in the United States Navy. There's a picture of him. He manned anti-aircraft um, guns during the attack of Pearl Harbor, for which he had no training at all. He was an African-American. He was not permitted to be trained um, on those guns, but he got on those guns and he used them. Um, after climbing out from, you know, underneath the debris and that sort of thing. Uh, he was recognized by the Navy for his actions and awarded the Navy Cross. So this was really a time um, in history where, you know, African Americans had proved themselves over and over and over again. But finally, they were beginning to listen a little bit. Not enough, not, not in terms of equality, um, but he was given a medal for his bravery and he was not even trained. He wasn't even allowed to be trained on these guns. So it's really interesting to look at that heroism. I think his story is pretty wonderful. Okay. All right. So that is pretty much uh, chapter uh, 11 and we will have some activities um, that I will assign that we would do in class, class time. Um, and we will talk about those and have a great day. Thank you.